Hello, my name is Jakub and uh, I'm very glad and happy that you are joining us today on our Facebook live chat on the Digital Single Market Facebook page. Hi, I'm Eva. I hope you will enjoy the next 45 minutes and uh, we will be speaking about cybersecurity. Now, we all know that the digital technologies and digital transformation brings huge opportunities for businesses and people. But at the same time, as we are all the time connected, we need to make sure that our services, systems and devices are well protected in the cyberspace. This involves citizens, business, research centers, but also big institutions or service providers in healthcare, energy and transport that depend on digital technologies. They need to be know that they can't be hacked. Now, 86% of Europeans think that the, the risk of becoming the victim of a cyber attack is growing. And that's why we said that we will organize today this uh, Facebook live chat with our experts to provide you answers to the questions that you might uh, have or to your comments. So there are two ways how you can join in the Facebook live chat. The first way is if you are on Facebook, you can comment just under this video. Uh, you can paste your question or comment and we'll make sure that we answer it. If you are more a Twitter person, we also monitor the hashtag AskCyberEU, so feel free to tweet these questions there as well. We will be speaking with Despina Spano, and she is the Director of Cybersecurity Trust and, uh, Cybersecurity Trust and, Society and Digital Society at the European Commission. She will be giving hints about what the uh, European Union can do policy-wise to prevent these cyber threats. Afterwards, we will have uh, someone speaking about uh, tips to prevent uh, that they attack you as a citizen. Now, Eva, I want to remind one more thing, that is that October is the European Cybersecurity Month, which is an awareness campaign, and we'll talk about it as well. But I already suggest that if you have some time, maybe later today, you can check the website uh, of the Cybersecurity Month, and you will find many tips, uh, best practices, and there is a, even a quiz to test your skills in cybersecurity. So feel free to explore mm -hmm. that. But let's get moving into the chat. So it's our pleasure to welcome the Spina Spanu uh, here in the studio in in, uh, the European Commission in Brussels. Thank Hello. you very much, Jakub. It's a pleasure to be here, and I thank all of those who are participating uh, already with their questions and now live uh, to this activity that is indeed part of Cybersecurity Month, a time that is for the fifth year actually that we spend uh, talking about what everybody can do as part of the responsibility that we all have vis a vis cybersecurity. Welcome, Despina, and good morning. Have you ever been a victim of a cyber threat? Probably I have been, um, I, not in the sense that I have suffered the impact and the consequences of a major attack, but I have probably been uh, a target already because I have received, like many of you, those emails that invite you to click on links uh, or to open attachments from sources that uh, are hardly recognizable or are known to me or that announce to me something that either sounds too good to be true or completely surreal. Uh, and uh, I make sure I delete those emails I, and therefore they do not have the impact of actually attacking my system. But I probably have also been um, a victim of a cyber attack without knowing. Uh, one of the most um, usual areas where attackers hit is bank accounts. And in that area, the banks themselves manage an attack. So maybe my account has been hacked, but I will never know because this is taken care of by a responsible operator. Okay, but now how do you make sure that you personally, that your services or your accounts are well protected? What do you do? I do what everybody should do um, about their connected products. So first of all, I make sure I have software that protects me online, uh, cybersecurity software, uh, that I have software that not only protects my desktop or my tablet, but also my TV system that is interconnected. Everything that comes from my network, I make sure this stays updated and I make sure that I get informed. So I ask my telecom operator if they provide regular updates. I try to to shop around for the better cybersecurity products and understand what fits my needs. Let's move now from the personal to the global sphere. WannaCry, NonPetya, Bad Rabbit, just a couple of days ago. These were recently some of the main cyber attacks in the world. They, uh, they attack uh, public IT systems and commercial, including hospitals, railways, large uh, industrial sites across the EU. The ransom was spread over two 150 countries. Is today the EU ready to face these challenges? 
Well, these uh, recent uh, cyber attacks that you mentioned, and for those who may not know, these were attacks uh, that basically went uh, straight to the heart of the system by attacking hospitals, uh, train transport, uh, they attacked the individuals, more than 156,000, I think, people were affected by WannaCry. So I think they were a very good reminder of the fact that cyber attacks are there, they're growing, they become more sophisticated, all cyber crime evolves, uh, and so must uh, our response systems. So they were a good reminder, but they also tested our systems. WannaCry could have had devastated effects if we were not as prepared as we are. So so in Europe, I think we have a very strong system. We are an area where we have a cybersecurity law already that applies to 28 countries and that requires them to have strong national systems, emergency response teams. These are the people who make sure that these attacks do not spread everywhere and do not become devastating. So it reminded us that we have all that so we can manage, but it is not enough. This is why in September, President Juncker, as one of his main priorities, for the remaining time of the mandate of this commission announced a very big policy package on cybersecurity that was consisting not anymore in just a strategic approach but on concrete actions how to make a stronger Europe. And now we have a Twitter question regarding this. Gonzalo Carrizo from uh, Portugal, he is asking how the EU could handle a cyber attack presumably perpetuated by a nation state? Well, uh, we have to clarify that uh, in the European Commission we make proposals that are linked to the internal market. We, of course, have now also European policy on defence. So the cybersecurity package was built around that. Then every government has its own national security systems to which Europe does not intervene. The question pertains more, I would say, to national security questions where we do not intervene. It is not the place of Europe. And how can ENISA, the EU cybersecurity agency, can help in these situations? So, what is ENISA, for those who may not know? Because ENISA is an agency that has been there since 2004. It was basically an independent agency that was built by the European institutions to create uh, a central point of advice and knowledge and expertise in cybersecurity because we didn't have that. So, I think we were quite early in Europe in creating uh, this uh, hub of expertise and knowledge. It is a very small agency that has so far made wonders compared to its size because it is helping member states build their capacity. Now, there are countries in Europe that have excellent capacities in cybersecurity, that have national systems, that have built emergency response teams and systems very well, but not everybody has been able to do that. So ENISA is helping everybody get uh, a bit of the pie of knowledge, exchange best practices, and actually contributes with real help to cybersecurity questions. So when it comes to encryption, which is a very basic element of cybersecurity, they create knowledge, Knowledge, they make studies that they make available to everyone. So it is really an agency that is helping everybody know, have the same level, uh, so to speak, of knowledge and go deeper in the knowledge and provides even practical help to member states. For the future, we are proposing a design of an agency that will be even more meaningful in its contribution. So in case of cyber attacks, we are proposing that the NISA can be called upon by those member states that may find it necessary or by all member states if that is deemed by the occasion to help uh, to go and provide advice on how to cover vulnerabilities, how to make sure an attack doesn't spread, carry out an investigation on how it happens so that it doesn't happen again, etc. So we are trying to build upon its existing knowledge and make it even stronger and become a, a point of help for all the member states. We will move now to education because we have some questions in Facebook. Oscar Rodicio from Spain, he asked, Hello, I would like to know whether additional guidelines for education departments at national level are foreseen to be introduced once the new cybersecurity packet will be passed. If so, will be there any substantial changes regarding prevention and proceeding? Thanks in advance. It's a very good question. In fact, uh, the latest uh, communication, this is the Europe's way of announcing policy. So in this communication that was uh, announced by President Juncker, in fact, skills and education have a central role. Of course, we shouldn't make cybersecurity protection for people so difficult that it requires special skills, skills and special education. But cyber hygiene, so what we talked about earlier, everybody having their system of responsibility has to become part of the culture. 
So we are proposing that member states should develop this kind of education in their national curricula and where Europe can help by providing best practices from one member state to the other, this will be done. We are proposing the creation of a platform for education and skills where everybody can draw knowledge from, both in cyber security and also cyber defense. So a number of measures, but that will require a lot of help from the government itself. So we'll hope we will get the help now. Well, I think people must speak up. Yeah. I think people, mm -hmm. where they see they need, they must do it. I was very touched to see that uh, in my daughter's school, a public school in Belgium, uh, they have something specific for Cybersecurity Month to teach children, even at primary school, what it is. So I think this is what more of the governments must do. It's very simple. And we have, I think, another question on education. Yeah, well... There was also one thing. Recently, there were statistics that uh, there are not many women in the cybersecurity industry, right? Uh, now, what can the EU do or what can the society do in order to have more women working for the cybersecurity industry? So, thank you very much for this question. And interestingly, it comes from a man. Yes. <laughs> so, 11% um, is the figure of women in cybersecurity. You know that we have a very big umbrella um, initiative in the European Union for women in tech because it is a more general issue, women in technology. And in cybersecurity, it is true, it is quite low. And it is part of our efforts to bridge the skills gap to bring women more uh, in this sector. In Europe, we do see a change. Uh, take as example myself, so I am the director for cybersecurity of the European Commission, but even more importantly, dare I say, the commissioner who is in charge of this portfolio is Maria Gabriel, a woman with very strong views on the role of women in policy making, who I think is also having her own ideas on how to bring women forward in this sector. All right, I must admit it was my question, but I only gave a voice to a Twitter user whose name was uh, Raquel Saiz, who yes. asked it on who Twitter. Is uh, who is probably a lady? But I think many sorry. men are interested yeah. in that as well, so I think we replied that question very well. If I can say something, uh, and uh, to the extent that this can be educational, there is often a fear that this is a very technical sector, and it is no different than any other area where a woman could exercise uh, the very good knowledge and uh, invest uh, in their expertise. But no. uh, it's good because we have two experts here and the next one that will come, it's also, it's also a, woman. a woman. So <laughs> we are as a role model, I would say, <laughs> or you are the role model. Let's hope so. Now, I would like to move to another topic, which is what we call smart living. And you already mentioned it, that you have your TV connected and, and, and all the systems at home. But it will be more because there are studies that, that estimate that from 26 to 50 billion devices can be connected to the Internet very soon, in a few years. Now, all of these devices will use some software will will depend on on also good cybersecurity protection so my question is how can consumer be consumers be sure once they buy a smart tv or smart fridge or any other device how can they be sure that they are buying a device which will be connected but in a secure way so first of all you are right connection is now part of everybody's life Everybody who owns a smartphone is already connected. You don't need to be into connected fridges or kettles to uh, be part of the connected society. So we're all in this sort of smart world now. And that will only start increasing and people will start making even more uses of connected devices because of mobile health, because of other applications that come and make our lives better and easier. So that's one reason why we need to make sure that people trust what they buy. For the physical world, for every other product, we have developed in the internal market a fantastic core of legislation, which is either sectoral, so for instance we have special safety laws for cars, for toys, for medical devices, etc. But we also have general laws that say everything that circulates in the internal market must be safe. We do not have any laws of that kind for cybersecurity. We do have certain sectoral legislation, so there's some laws for specific areas, I just mentioned medical devices, for instance, where they must have inherent specific elements that deal with cybersecurity. But we don't have the so-called safety net. So in the 
package of uh, actions that were announced by President Juncker in September, we also proposed the European Certification System. To make that simple for people to understand, this is a system by which we will be able to provide a market where products and services that are connected, either on their own or through other devices, meet at least a minimum of security requirements that uh, is at European level. And therefore, if they're approved in one country, they can circulate in the whole of the European Union. Now, at the beginning, this is a voluntary system because it would be very difficult to know how many connected devices we have and to start proposing uh, specific certification schemes. But we hope that from the market there will be an uptake and that um, the industry itself will want to sell certified products so that the consumer can actually verify that this is the case. Today, when you buy uh, an electrical appliance, you usually check there is a CE mark that means uh, it meets certain norms. Eventually, we should get at that when it comes to connected devices. So, it's just a follow-up question from Twitter that we just got from Paolo Cucci. I hope I'm reading the, the name right. And he's asking, is there or will there be a common EU seal or label uh, for cybersecurity for companies? Do we plan that? Well, this is uh, something that uh, we are uh, following for sure, also through the Alliance on the Internet of Things that we have set up with the industry. But uh, it goes too fast for the EU to be able to propose now a specific label that would fit every type of device. I think that the first step was the legislation that we proposed, and we hope that the co-legislator would adopt it, because that would mean that you have more products and services that meet minimum requirements. Eventually, these products will want to be, because they are certified, also recognized as certified. So we expect that there will be labels uh, that will show that. And I think this is the desirable outcome. But the first step for what people have to do is to encourage their governments, because they are part of the co-legislator and the European Parliament, to adopt these proposals, because the faster we do so, the faster we will start having a system in place that creates this society of trusted and certified products. Now, you mentioned the, the EU member states, uh, but in setting up the minimum standards, let's say, the minimum requirements, do you plan to work also with industry or with more stakeholders to set really the, the minimum levels? Well, the governance system for this certification framework is uh, largely inclusively, inclusive and consultative. So the industry, the stakeholders have a key role to play. They're the ones who will basically create the basis for what will be proposed to be certified. So I think uh, they are waiting for it. We have a very large part of the industry that has been calling for this certification system. It was not just an idea that came from the European Commission and we had promised to do it already one year ago so we've been working on it also with the industry for a long time. And speaking about industry, one of the major topics for European industry is automatic on uh, connected mobility. Cars, ships, trains or planes exchange big amounts of data and this has to be in a secure way. Imagine that you are in a self-driving car at 130 kilometers per hour. Uh, you cannot manage that the car has been, can be hacked. How could the EU help making self-driving mobility and cars better protected? Well, we, we have to um, realize that there is no difference in the connected world from the actual world. When cars started being manufactured, uh, everybody was asking questions, how will I know it is safe? How will I know that it is fine? And for that, we have uh, specific ways, and we trust that the car that we buy has been checked, tested, and is safe for us to drive. We now are working on the cars of the very near future, because these cars are already being manufactured, the connected cars. And it is true, they can offer a very large surface for a potential cyber attack that can have an incredible impact. However, what we are proposing and what we're working on with the industry is that cybersecurity becomes an inherent part of the car. And in fact, uh, this could make connected cars even safer because you can have safeguards that allow a car to stop if it is being attacked, for instance, and to prevent from the attack going further. So in fact, connectivity can only be beneficial for this kind of new driving. So we're already working on that because we're in the process of working with the industry in a very large manner in the European Commission on connected and automated driving. So I think the idea is that every car that is 
checked uh, for its safety in the future and it is connected, it has been checked also for its cyber security. And let us not forget that for the cars we own today, we have systems of controls that allow the European Commission through a rapid alert system to often make recalls of cars. We should not exclude that through software updates we will be able to avoid recalls in the future and simply fix problems. And how important is in this particular area the collaboration among member states? Very important because we have to make sure that we are working again in an internal market and that everybody enjoys the same levels and we have the same technological measures. We have a specific fora within which we do that. We see that the governments are really making an effort. It is very uh, challenging to bring together everybody because there are many authorities that are involved. There is not just transport, there's the digital infrastructure that will connect the cars to the system. So we're trying to work in a very holistic manner. But we know that there is a lot of willingness. Back in March of this year, we had the agreement of 27 member states of the European Union to work together on deploying connected cars and testing them in a cross-border manner, so across the European Union. In the European Union, we have borders through which you reach one country uh, very easily from another. And part of those uh, tests uh, will also include the cybersecurity of these cars. I'm personally looking forward to try them, these person, <laughs> these uh, uh, self-driving cars. And to be doing other things while, and, while yes, we are being exactly. Tested. But this is another topic. Now, I would just like to remind everyone who is following us that uh, you can still send your questions and comments. Uh, there are two ways how you can do it. Either you uh, comment under this video on Facebook and we'll collect that question, or you can tweet with the hashtag AskCyberEU and we'll also uh, make sure that your question is answered. If we don't manage to answer all the questions during the video chat, we'll come back to you and answer them in written. And this brings me to one uh, very simple question that uh, we just got on Facebook from Tanya Matiasiewicz Medros, and she's asking, uh, what about SMEs? So, what I understand uh, that SMEs produce, uh, you know, products, and what should they do? How can maybe? How is the EU helping them to make the products uh, safer, or, or what? What is the? What is there in the for SMEs in the in the cyber? security package? I think that uh, the uh, small and medium-sized enterprises have a lot to gain from our, our recent uh, proposals, exactly because they can be part of this system of certification that I mentioned, so they can enjoy a system that will be less cumbersome than what exists uh, today. We should not give the impression that nothing exists today. There are a lot of national initiatives and there's even a system for certifying certain products for 13 different countries. However, uh, what we don't have is something that goes across the European member states and that does not require that a producer, in particular an SME, has to go to each and every country to become certified because that is cumbersome and that can cost a lot and it can cost so much that it's counterproductive for an SME. So the proposal that we have put in place would make it much easier for an SME to get a product certified across the European Union and sell the products uh, everywhere. So I think it will create a better market for these companies because indeed in Europe, we know that we have a very large percentage of SMEs that work in the area of cybersecurity. And not only SMEs, but also a lot of startups working in general uh, with internet and that need uh, some protection. Coming back to Twitter, we got another question related to university and to uh, schools and education. How the EU intends to provide a good education and awareness on cybersecurity starting from schools and universities? And the question comes from Gianna Calti. So we mentioned earlier, uh, it's interesting that we have so many questions on education, which shows you that governments still have uh, a lot to do. I think the effort of Cybersecurity Month is very interesting because if you go to the website, cybersecuritymonth.eu, you will see that you have um, per country all the initiatives that take place and people start sharing examples and copying one another. And the platform that we are proposing to create will aim exactly at that. So those that have done it already better can learn from those that have not yet done it. It is true that we estimate today a skill gap of more than 300,000 professionals by 2020 in the area of cybersecurity. So we need to work on two areas. First, uh, in education systems that teach people to have the so-called cyber hygiene, so to make sure they are responsible in a connected society because everybody can be the weak link, because anybody can enter through one system to another the, the moment you are connected. 
And the second is to create enough people who manage this world, so enough cybersecurity experts. So for the second, we are addressing that in the area of skills. We have a very large coalition for uh, digital skills, and there we are uh, financing through the European budget traineeships in this area. So it is very important that the industry and companies engage in providing such traineeships, teaching people to do that. We need more cybersecurity experts in the public sector. So we need people who engage in the bigger picture and not just go to the private sector. And then the basic curricula in the schools, which again is a matter for the governments to decide. Again, speaking about the governments and member states, we have another question on Twitter, which is the Cyber Act can be a chance, but positions, concerns of member states have to be considered. How do you plan to engage with member states? Well, the legislative process in the European Union is a very inclusive, consultative process. We have regular meetings. We've already had uh, three or four meetings at the Council with all the member states, not just with the experts that sit in Brussels, but also those that come from the capitals. This is part of the process. It is how we do legislation always. So we will do the same. We also go ourselves to the member states and discuss with all the authorities on cybersecurity. And what we hear so far is that there is very large support for what the Commission has proposed. There are, of course, details that need to be worked out as to the role of the European Cybersecurity Agency and NISA, and then how this certification system will work. But this is part of making a law. We do not think that there will be fundamental problems. There is really a great support. Now, when we are talking about governments and, and public services in general, uh, long time ago it has been basically paper-based. And unfortunately, it's still in some countries, but it's getting more digital and, and public services are becoming more digital. Now the question is what can what or what should the governments do in order to protect all the data that they collect and how is the EU and, and the EU approach helping these governments to, to really ensure 100% cyber security of, uh, of the databases that they collect? Uh, indeed, it would be inconsistent for a European Commission that has proposed a whole e-government action plan, so the digital transformation of government services and the interconnection, not just within countries of people and their digital government services, but between countries, that we would not make sure that these are very well protected. So the first thing we have to uh, tell our people so that they are assured is that the cybersecurity law that was introduced and is now under implementation, it will be fully enforced and implemented in May 2018 some people hear that, the experts, they know it as the NIS directive, has required that operators of essential services always meet cybersecurity requirements. And to address the question, what does that mean, we have proposed the European certification system. So uh, we would uh, suggest, and we have already done it in the communication that we adopted the same day we adopted the, uh, the rest of the package on cybersecurity, that public administrations make sure that they rely on products that are certified, products that meet uh, at least a minimum of security requirements as required by the law. Speaking now about citizens, Belgian researchers have revealed a flaw in the security protocol of Wi-Fi networks, which makes tens of millions of consumer businesses and government targeted to be hacked. Wi-Fi wi networks susceptible to be targeted? Do you think it's a problem? Should we worry about? Can the EU do something? Yes, uh, this was um, recently uh, in the press. I think a lot of people were alarmed to see it because it has to do with our secured networks at home. So the potential surface of attack uh, is indeed enormous. If you look at the advice that the European Cybersecurity Agency issued, the NISA, the first thing they said is that you shouldn't panic. We don't have any indications that somebody is trying to use that vulnerability. Uh, and it would need to be someone who is close to the network, because the way it works is that somebody interferes without having your credentials in your network and then has access to your system. So we don't have any indications that this has been used. People should be vigilant always, especially when using public Wi-Fi, because this can be more vulnerable and they have less control over it. So it is good that they take a minimum of measures as to how often and where they use public Wi-Fi. For their homes, they should update their software, their security software. This is fundamental. And of course, once uh, uh, we have the patches, because the patches are the corrections of these vulnerabilities, I think everybody should 
should be reassured. So everybody's working on it. There has been advice I issued by ENISA, uh, the Cybersecurity Agency, but also Europol. Uh, we should not forget that Europol very often issues very interesting advice. We were speaking about Wi-Fi at, wi at home and uh, protected Wi-Fi, but now the EU is investing to get public places with free Wi-Fi. Can the consumers tr trust uh, such networks? I think that, again, the public Wi-Fi's are set up by, their, by the public authorities or, uh, or the local authorities, etc. And since they are required by the law to meet uh, cybersecurity requirements, I think these may even be safer than privately uh, offered uh, uh, so-called public Wi-Fi. So we have to distinguish between a public Wi-Fi that will come from a public authority and that will have to meet high security requirements because of the cybersecurity law, and a public Wi-Fi that is offered by private operator that, of course, then relies on the level of responsibility that this operator offers and, and has. And I think that there, in the future, because of the cybersecurity certification system, one will be able to sell their public Wi-Fi as one that is certified and therefore have an increased trust uh, uh, towards the users and the consumers. Now, we got a question on Facebook about eHealth. Uh, it's from Healthcare Cyber Risk Summit. And um, they are asking us, will there be initiatives specially related uh, to protecting healthcare data, for example, in hospitals and clinics, as well as the in the eHealth industry? So what, what will be done in eHealth in terms of cybersecurity? So, a couple of things. Indeed, as you know, eHealth uh, has been also put as a priority uh, by President Juncker in the Digital Single Market Strategy. This was announced in May already, and we're working on that. And indeed, as we're working on connecting digital infrastructure for the benefit of patients, hospitals, and caregivers, etc., it is very important that we do that with security as priority number one, because there you're dealing with very personal uh, data, first of all, that have to be protected, but also with the lives of people who can take care through a connected system. It is important to remember that, again, the cybersecurity law uh, asks member states to notify those providers of essential services that um, are required to meet very high cybersecurity standards. And these uh, will have to do so by November 2018. So should hospitals be considered, and in my view they will be in most cases uh, considered and identified as essential services providers, then they will have, by essence, to meet such requirements. And we have seen recently that this will be necessary because WannaCry also affected uh, the medical system, the hospitals, actually. We are having a lot of questions in Twitter and in Facebook. So we are now going to speak about the EU cyber packet. Uh, and they ask, what about the proposal for a blueprint? Did you consider the role of the private sector in incident handling? We have to explain that the blueprint is a protocol for member states to collaborate together about how to address a cyber attack. So, indeed, the blueprint is a recommendation to everyone as to who does what in a case of a major incident, because we don't have such a playbook today. It is quite extraordinary. So this was quite urgent. So we propose this, indeed, uh, the role of undertaking. So a major attack will not only happen to the public sector. So the blueprint is not just about a major incident in the case of public administration being attacked. So there are protocols that are also linked to the undertakings. Of course, undertakings have obligations to notify such attacks, because this is the first step. So while we're working on the blueprint, I think also undertakings and uh, companies, the industry more globally, have to also themselves become uh, more responsible in notifying these incidents because this is the first step. But indeed, this is part of the blueprint. They also have a role also in the, the investigations, uh, uh, the link to the European Cybersecurity Agency, etc. And the blueprint, if I should, um, if I can add, uh, also identifies who does what for the European institutions so that we can have a role and help member states, including if um, the attack affects concerns uh, third countries, where we have the external action service that comes in. So it is a very large, it goes at very large strength uh, when it comes to our response to cyber attacks. So it's urgent to get it done. 
absolutely. I'm now happy that we are followed and that the Facebook chat is followed by many people who are knowledgeable and who know about the EU policy because the other question is on NIS directive uh, and it comes from Thomas PLBXL which means probably someone from Brussels here and he's asking whether you think that the NIS directive will be implemented on time in line with the cybersecurity package or slowed down at the member states level? We have no indication that anybody has a wish to slow it down. And what the Commission did with the package that came out in September is we issued a communication, which is a document that gives further guidance to all the member states how to implement this law. So that should help them in the run-up to the last six months until the implementation date, which again is May 2018. The Member States have welcomed this help and we have already set up under the directive, under this law, a cooperation group that is very active, continues to work together, issues guidelines so that they help each other because of course there are Member States with more expertise than others. So the system so far shows great willingness and one process does not interfere with the other. We have to implement the NIS directive, which was the first step, because what does it mean for people to understand? The NIS directive basically imposed on every member state to have a national strategy on cybersecurity and an emergency response team, and to identify those essential services uh, operators who have an obligation to meet cybersecurity requirements and to notify incidents. So once we have all that together, we will need the laws that we have also now proposed regarding the mandate of the European agents and the certification system. So it is all very complementary. All right. Now, we're running out of time for this first part. I'm sorry, because I think the discussion could take much longer. But um, maybe to sum up, as we already mentioned, the Commission has presented <coughs> his, uh, its big package on cybersecurity in September. Uh, now, what for you would be the three main points of that package that you would like uh, people to, to take, take from there? So the first is uh, a more united, collaborative and effective response to cyber attacks so because we moved from a reactive to a proactive approach with this package. The second is a secure society, a secure society of products and services. And the third is better knowledge and expertise in cybersecurity, also through the creation of the competence center that we had not the opportunity to mention, and the network of the existing competence centers that will pull together the expertise we have in cybersecurity. So, better response, and more coordinated amongst the EU, better knowledge to address the skill gaps, etc., and a secure society. Okay. Okay, October is ending now and with it the awareness campaign on cybersecurity and, and that the Commission and ISA and the Member States put in place. Uh, this campaign it was to tell people cybersecurity concern us all. We need to get informed and evolve. Therefore, we are also with uh, us, Anne Menens, from the cybersecurity expert uh, in the Directorate General of Informatics of the European Commission and is one of the drivers of the Cyber Aware uh, Programme. And I wanted to first uh, come with another uh, Twitter, um, Facebook in this case, uh, slash prod in Anderleg. They are saying we are holding a cybersecurity day in a school in Brussels right after your session. Do you have any message recommendation that we pa can pass on the little cyber cops of tomorrow? Well, if I may start, uh, welcome Anne. Uh, I'm very happy you join, uh, you join us. Well, first of all, that these are the cyber cups uh, of the future. Uh, but the first thing they have to do is to protect themselves uh, with very basic steps they can take. So they have to ask the moment they put their hands on a phone, they have to ask what they must do to be secure. If uh, they do not have the legal age to buy a software themselves, they need to make sure that they buy something that has the right level of protection. And the second thing is not to be naive. It's very important not to be naive. If you receive an email that looks too good to be true, then it is. Do not open it, do not click, just delete it and protect yourself. So they're very simple steps that these cyber cops can uh, take. And if you see something that looks serious, then report it to the national authorities. You may be able to help them prevent an attack going further. What do you think, Anne? I fully agree. I couldn't <laughs> have said it better. But uh, indeed, the, the youth, of which, are the, which is the future, they, they should from day one have a good cyber hygiene and pay attention on what, what is good and what is not good. Protect themselves, use safe passwords, 
just not post whatever on, on internet or on Facebook, on Instagram, whatever uh, tool they're using because it's out there and it, the information stays there and they might not find it important now but maybe in 10 years or in 20 years from now there'll still be some, some pictures of them uh, which they don't want to be there anymore so it's always a moment that they should think before they post. All right, I, I might have uh, one question for you both now, and it's about the Commission's activity. So what would you, Despina, first say the Commission is doing to, to better inform people about cybersecurity and, and also businesses, because it's both, both, both groups need to be involved? So the first thing we do is we support the Cybersecurity Agency with uh, the Cybersecurity Month. So five years now and uh, we have established that this must continue in our latest uh, policy directions. And uh, I think this is fundamental. So we continue the awareness activities. What we also do with the Cybersecurity Agency is exercises that test our system with all the countries. We have an exercise called Cyber Europe. It takes place every two years. We are now proposing to make it a yearly exercise because of the emergency that is now uh, around our societies uh, due to uh, proliferating cyber attacks. So this is also a very important uh, uh, task of the European Commission, working with the member states to prevent that they have systems that cannot uh, sustain a cyber attack. And then um, our two agencies, NISA and Europol, uh, which uh, often um, actually use the social media for providing advice to people, uh, top tips uh, how to deal with the cyber attack attack, etc. All right. Well, thank you very much. And the same question for you. I understand that the Commission is not only doing awareness outside, but as many people work for the Commission and, and you are from the department which is, um, which is coordinating uh, the IT part of the Commission. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, you can say it better probably, but, but the question is what the Commission is also doing inside so that people in the Commission uh, know about cybersecurity challenges. Okay, first of all, the Commission, of course, is dealing with a lot of important information, a lot of important uh, uh, policy legislation they're preparing, they're doing uh, big competition deals, and also they're managing a lot of funds. Uh, so there is a lot of sensitive information and a lot of critical assets that need to be protected. So we, from our side, we also ensure that we have a proper protection for our systems and that we prevent any attacks. And we're also, on the other side, uh, reinforcing the incident management capacity in case there would be a problem that we are immediately on it and that we're dealing with it as as well as we can and then uh, in addition to that not only the technical aspects are important but of course the whole staff should be involved in being uh, in protecting the commission against attacks so we have this specific uh, program which is called cyberware which is aimed at increasing the cyber awareness of all the commission staff it's a joint program from uh, involving different dgs who are working on cyber security so also dg connect and what we're doing is um, we we uh, have a number of things to actually what we're doing is practicing what we preach because we preach towards the member states what they should do how they should be uh, become more aware how the citizens should be more aware and we do the same thing inside the commission thank you very much despina for having been with us thank you for having me thank i hope you. it was useful yes. yes thank you very much and now it's time to speak about the cyber agent cyber agent are about tips uh, for citizens and companies on, on how to protect themselves better against cyber attacks uh, and why do I need a secure password? So your, your password is actually something like the key that opens your, your, the lock to your data, to your information. So it can be uh, a word, it can be a, a combination of, of signs. And it's important that you use this so that your data and your access to an account is protected. Even better, if there is a possibility for logging in to, to use two-factor authentication, uh, we, we really recommend that you do it. So that combines not only the knowledge that you have in your head, namely the password, with uh, something that you have, like uh, your phone or a token, uh, and you have to identify twice. So it, it's much more difficult to really uh, uh, take over your account. And for, for passwords, uh, also it's very important to keep them secret and to use them, to, to change them frequently because uh, in a number of cases there are some breaches and then uh, when the, your password has been breached, 
uh, it's available online for anybody to reuse, so it's important that uh, you regularly uh, change it. And for changing, what we recommend is actually uh, that you keep a password uh, secret, really secret, don't share it with anyone. Take something uh, not too complex, but something you can easily remember, and we recommend a very long password, so that's less easy to breach. So stars and dots and question marks and all these things in it's the passport, bit, right? Not necessarily, because that makes it very difficult to, to remember it. So uh, we, we go more in the direction of suggesting a passphrase, which is something you can remember. It can be something from a song or something, a mantra for yourself. Uh, every morning uh, I need to do more sports or whatever, but a bit more complicated, of course, but really your thing that you, you can remember for yourself. Right. Yes, because at this time when we have so many devices, it's very complicated to remember very different passwords. So. Yes, it's true, but that's why we recommend this. Uh, it's also possible to use password managers if you select a, a safe one, uh, and then it will help you to access different data. And another advice, maybe um, always keep your professional and, and personal life separated, so don't reuse passwords that you use in your professional life. I think I saw many European startups actually providing this password manager, so it's a yeah. good idea to, to explore that field. Now, um, when I told my wife this morning that we will have a session on cyber hygiene and cyber tips, she asked me one simple question. Uh, could you ask whether or who can access data that is sent via instant messaging services like Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, or Twitter direct messages? Who mm -hmm. can see these things? Is it well, really well protected or should people keep in mind that this data uh, is sent to a platform and then can be accessed? In principle, it's well protected and, and some of the tools even use encrypted uh, uh, messaging, so, so there there is no problem. Of course, if your system has been hacked, uh, the hackers have access to everything so they can see whatever you do. Um, if we talk about uh, information that you make available on Facebook or so, there I would recommend to, to really look at your privacy settings so that you, you choose yourself who can see what you post and, and who can see your pictures, who can see your messages, etc. I saw so many friends of mine with notebooks and with a sticker on, on the camera. Yes. And they were telling me, you know, you never know who is watching, who is spying. So is, there, is this something that people should also keep in mind that once they have a camera on their computers or maybe in their phones, mm -hmm. uh, can this be accessed remotely and is it good, uh, good uh, practice to keep that in mind and make some measures to prevent that? Um, yes, indeed. Unfortunately, uh, if your computer is hacked, also your camera can be hacked. And what is even worse, because normally when your camera is on, you get a you get a sign, the light goes on or so, but they, they are so sophisticated, they can start the camera without you noticing it. And on top of that, uh, not only the camera, but also the microphone can be can be started. So uh, if you are going into a specific uh, meeting, it's always good practice to leave maybe your mobile phone outside. And how can we know if uh, the device has been, ha has been hacked? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> eh? uh, that's why we have specialists. If you really have uh, if you, a suspicion that your tool has been hacked, I would recommend that you go to the help desk in case of an organization and ask them to, to verify. Sometimes there are certain things from which you can uh, notice your, your system has become slower or there, there are things not going as you want or at once there are Chinese signs appearing on your screen or and you've never done dealt with China or Russian, whatever, uh, strange things. So, so always be vigilant and watch out for any suspicious element. And uh, we speak a lot about uh, different wordings and people might not understand. We speak mm -hmm. about ransom, malware mm -hmm. and about phishing, for example. What is phishing for people who want to know more? So phishing, it's actually a bit like going fishing. Uh, what happens is that people with a malicious intent are trying to obtain information from you. So they're trying to fish uh, your information. And it can be done in different ways. Uh, the most known is the phishing emails. So they send you a mail, uh, which is something that looks normal to you. And you're asked either to click on a link or to open an attachment or to provide some personal data. 
And um, as was said already earlier, if this email is offering you something that is too good to be true, it's unfortunately probably too good to be true. So and next to emails, it can also be an SMS. There can be other ways. There is also known that uh, people get phone calls, uh, so, so said from uh, Microsoft, telling that they need to update their system and they need to provide their password and information. So all these are ways to try to collect your data. Uh, so always be vigilant. Uh, your help desk from your organization will never phone you to ask for your information, nor will your internet service provider. No. Oh, so, so the yeah, message sorry. is one second. The message is then, don't open these emails, which look suspicious. But what to do to prevent them arriving all the time? Uh, spam box, uh, filters, filtered, uh, uh, filters. So uh, if I take the commission as an example, we have uh, we're actually filtering. Uh, millions of mails, spam mails, before they reach our systems. So we're filtering a lot out, um, and normally big organizations do that. Uh, we're also stopping malware at the border. But of course, and that's why we need to involve the staff, some do get passed, and that's uh, why we, we have recently installed actually a spam reporting button. So uh, Outlook or any other uh, mail account, some uh, provide the, the possibility to, to report uh, suspicious mails. And that's important. We really need people to report to us because it helps us to get a view on what is there. If, are there any campaigns are going? Is it a mail that is being sent out to many people? So we can take specific measures. Now, I would again come back to the more general, uh, general audience because you mentioned that these emails uh, or phone calls or SMS arrive because some organizations or people want to collect other people's data. Now, yes. many people might ask the question, why does someone, somebody want my data? Why do they want to collect my data? Okay, so there is different reasons. Eh? First of all, there is a possibility of financial gain if it's related to your, your uh, visa card or your, your bank account number. People want to get hold of those and get access to your financial information. That's how, how uh, a few years ago it all started and, and uh, that's also why banks are, were one of the first to really establish good measures uh, to prevent this. Um, then secondly, what happens also is that uh, the hackers are just collecting information, whatever information they can have. But because they collect a lot of information, you get this kind of big data and, and uh, they can do a lot with it. So you alone might not be interesting, but you are linked to other people and those people again are linked to other people. And so they get a whole view, they can map who you are, who, and if they, if they really want to target a specific person, they can put them in the middle of that, see who they're linked to, uh, even design phishing mails, uh, which we call then spear phishing mails, who are so well done because it comes from a person they know or it's about something they know. So uh, everybody is important. Everybody is part of this big chain. So. Um, also, you can, uh, my daughter was actually asking the same, I'm not important. I said, yeah, but you're my daughter and I maybe know some people and, and that's how it goes. So the dots make the whole picture yeah. actually, so right? Now, we ever spoke about the, the big cyber attacks that uh, mainly companies that store people's data or mm -hmm. that handle people's data were victim of. And uh, so they are wanna cry or bad rabbit as we discussed. Yeah. Now, what can individuals, what can people do to make sure that they, their data, even in these situations, are protected. Okay, so if you don't want to be um, the victim of a ransomware, actually, the, it's, it's quite simple. You have to apply the basics of the cyber hygiene. You have to make sure that your systems are always updated and patched. Because what this ransomware is doing, it's actually making abuse of a vulnerability. So it's a flow, a technical flow that is there in your system. But as soon as it's known, uh, the operator sends updates so that your system is not vulnerable anymore. So it's very important to take your time to shut down your computer, uh, to install updates when they're offered to you, because then it's when your system is, is updated and better protected. And the big um, advice, of course, because in case you would get the vict become the victim of the ransomware, so what actually happens is that they take your data in a ransom, they encrypt it, and you cannot access it anymore and all your family pictures from the last 10-15 years are there and they're gone. You cannot reach them anymore 
unless you pay a ransom, as they say. But uh, the advice is always never pay, because odds are that they will not open up anyway. But uh, to prevent yourself against that is just take a backup. Always take a backup regularly, once a week, maybe every day if possible, uh, so that in case it happens to you, you just reinstall your system and you put your data back and your pictures are not lost. We are now uh, running a bit uh, out of time, so we'll go to I the, to the last, we yeah, yeah, two, to the last questions, two questions. Yeah. But um, we are getting very positive comments in Twitter and in Facebook, in the social media, but not uh, uh, many questions on the tips, but we still have a couple yes. of them. Okay. So now we, are, we were saying before about the password and how to secure uh, the password and how to remember and to use some apps about remembering passwords. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a lot of apps in the market. Uh, how can we know that the apps are secure and how are protected about against uh, cyber threats? Okay. Um, what, what we recommend is to, to use known apps, known resources. So what is in your app store on your mo mobile phone? Most of the time they're, uh, they're checked. What you also can do is to, to read about them before you install them. So read some reviews, and sometimes in the reviews you even read, this is a malware, don't install it. So uh, inform yourself before you download an app. Also, uh, regularly delete the apps that you're not, do, not using anymore because they, they keep on being there and you don't need them. So it's again a good cyber hygiene. So uh, inform yourself and think about whether you really need it, uh, and if not, don't do it. Thank you. I mean, we've discussed several tips. Again, the the scale is much, much larger and I think we can follow up maybe in written on the comments on Facebook chat or, or under the hashtag AskCyberEU. Now, I would have a last question for you. What would be the one thing that you want people who are watching or in general people who think about cybersecurity, what do you, what would you say, tell to them and what would be one message that you want to pass to them? Okay, the message I want to pass and it's actually also the message of the Cybersecurity Month is stop, before you do anything, stop, think, think about what you want to do and only then click or upload, connect, whatever. So take a moment to reflect on what you're doing and then do what you do and use the internet because it has so many wonderful possibilities. Thank you very much and this was a very interesting and educative uh, And we finished with the positive note That's at the it. end. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about threats and attacks, so, yeah, it's but true, so it's true. The internet that. is the great place to be and, and, to, and if you behave uh, in an informed way, then, yeah. then there should be no problem. Okay. Thank Thanks you very much. Thanks. And thanks to all of you who have been there following us. And uh, we hope you learned a lot about cybersecurity and a lot of tips about how to protect yourself. Don't forget that the Cybersecurity Month is ending next week. But you better follow up on all these tips that we have been saying because you, the risk is always there and you need to protect yourself. Now, we tried to answer as many questions as we could. Uh, there were some more, but we will try to follow them up uh, in written under the, under the Facebook post or on Twitter. Uh, also, thank you very much for watching. If you are watching the recording of this chat, which will be immediately available, and you have a question, feel free to ask it, feel free to comment, and we'll come back to you uh, as soon as we can uh, to answer and to provide information. And if you are still interested in the digital uh, policies, about the European digital policies, keep tuned with the digital single market uh, channels in Facebook and in Twitter. And on Instagram and on YouTube. And yes. We're on four networks. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all of our guests and thank you, Eva, for uh, doing it together. Thanks, Jakub, and see you next time. Have a great day.